wasn't sure if we were getting hit by lightning or more bricks had fallen out. <laughs> Keep that up and I'm going to need to try out that new AED machine out there. <laughs> Either that or it was a test of the hearing aids, I'm not sure. But gosh. Okay. Several of announcements. Let's buckle in. All right. Today is World Communion Sunday. So that's why the bulletin looks like that. We have Finance Committee is incorrect in the newsletter and the bulletin. So Finance Meeting is next Tuesday on the 10th, not the 8th, not the 18th, on the 10th. And then Stewardship Meeting is not going to be tomorrow evening, it will be next Sunday, right after the service. I uh, just want to also let you know in the bulletin it's incorrect uh, in terms of where our mission outreach monies will be going. Uh, this quarter they will be going to Straight Street and then we'll be doing the Ram House for Advent. Also, I don't know if you noticed when you came in, there's a table with all of our preschool children's pictures on it. Uh, we always do prayer partners where uh, somebody grabs a picture for the child and we ask that you pray for them during this school year. So if you haven't gotten a picture and you would like to, please get one. I think Margaret and Sharon will be out there this week and next week. Okay, let me see what else we got. All right, there's a Christian movie, The Blind, is this weekend at Valley View. I well, wanted we'll to let you know that. Also, Days for Girls is going to have their fundraiser. Hollywood Restaurant always uh, does a fundraiser with us for Days for Girls. That'll be on October the 11th, so a week from Wednesday. And that's from 4 to 9. So if you want to eat in, dine out, grab something, let them know you're with the Days for Girls, and they are working with us for that. Okay, last but not least, Halloween Trunk or Treat is coming up, so we have the flyers in your bulletin if you want to use that to invite children in your neighborhood or for anyone you know to come to Trunk or Treat. We always have a blast. I think some of the adults, myself included, have more fun than the kids. Uh, if you would like to do a trunk, then please let Paula or Amanda know so that we can reserve enough parking spaces. If you don't want to do a trunk, but you would like to contribute candy, then you're welcome to donate candy for that. And just so you know, we don't eat the leftover candy. We put it in the office, and Emily uses that for the candy bowls that you see up there. So, just wanted to let you know that. Have I missed anything? I have a lot. Excellent. Uh, the bells are done being worked on, and so now we're looking for um, a group of people that would go up and so that's what we're, so if you know of anybody or if you're south, just reach out to me and we can set it up. And if you need to know how to get there, we can go. <laughs> and we're to eat on the way. But anyway, we'll see. All right, anything else? Let's proceed with our show. Our opening prayer is found in the bulletin. I'll read the light print and invite you to read the bowl. Almighty God, from the ends of the earth, you have gathered us around Christ's table. We together. Have mercy on your church, troubles and divided. Us and make us Amen. Our opening hymn is found in the hymn number 189, Paris Lord Jesus. Please stand and drink.
God in the reading of your scripture. May your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts. May your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives. May your word be shown. Amen. Our first lesson comes from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and can be found on page 114 in your Pew Bible. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do for this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and, make, and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck, you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Herod. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Our second lesson is Psalm 78, verses 1-4 through 4 and 12-16. through 16 can be found in your bulletin. Every other name, 
so that at the name given to Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work on your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Well, today we are celebrating communion. And when we celebrate communion, we've got the bread and we've got the juice in the cup. And the plate that the bread is on known as a cap, and the cup that the juice is in is known as a chalice. Now back in the days that Jesus first did this, it would have been wine, because they didn't have the technology we do to have grape juice, which we use. And whenever we celebrate communion, um, I offer a prayer of blessing in front of the congregation. I say, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. And what we believe is at that moment, the Holy Spirit enters the bread and enters the cup. So when we consume the bread and the juice, we're taking the Holy Spirit into our bodies. And that's one of the reasons why after the service is over, we don't just throw this in the trash. But you and some of the other young people in the church Help by disposing it. We can eat the bread, or we can take it outside and crumble it up. We can take the juice outside and dump that out. By the way, this cup and the plate, these were all made by a man who has passed away. So it's a part of the testament to his faith. And I've talked with a lot of the adults in this church about seeing you and the other youth of this church go out with it. And one of the things we all love is how excited you look when you go out to spread the breadcrumbs and the juice and the great respect that you have for these elements. Because when we see you do that, it gives us, the adults, greater respect for what we're doing when we celebrate communion. Let's pray. Dear God, bless our children, the families that bring them to church, and the church that surrounds them with love and prayer. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is also in the hymnal, number 467, Trust in Event. Please stand straight.
Matthew. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then do you not believe me? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work out in the vineyard. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw, it did not change your minds and believe him. The word of God.
Whenever I hear the word credentials, it reminds me of the music maker. Robert Preston's most famous role was Professor Harold Hill in this musical first on the Broadway stage and then later in film. He plays a salesman who sells instruments and uniforms to start a boy's band in the small towns that he goes into. He whips up the people of the community in a frenzy, but then he leaves after all the supplies come in because he doesn't actually have any musical training. The members of the school board are portrayed in the 1962 film version by a real-life barbershop quartet known as the Buffalo Bills. And early on, he is talking with them, and they are working on behalf of the mayor to ask the professor to show his credentials. Where did he go to school? What kind of training did he have? And who has certified him to do this sort of work? And he's talking with them about music and about harmonizing, and he starts to get them singing. And after they begin this, he says to the mayor's wife, Mrs. Shin, from now on, you will never see one of those men without the other three. And she said, that's where you're wrong, professor. They're members of the school board, and they hated each other for years. But then you hear the sweet sounds of the harmony of a barbershop quartet. And it's a running gag throughout the rest of the play that they would go to him and say, now, Professor Hill, we need to see your credentials. But then he would change the subject, he'd introduce a song, and he'd start them singing again, which would give him the opportunity to slip off and then on to something else. Credentials are important. We want to know that professionals and people of particular occupations have had certain education and training and have been certified by their peers to do what they've been trained to do. Right now, my nephew is in Lyman School in North Georgia. He's going through training to learn to do this work that he's excited about doing. And following that, he'll need to do a paid internship for a while in order to become fully certified. Those are the kinds of credentials that he will need. It's a good thing we don't let just anybody who claims to be mechanically inclined climb up a pole and deal with all of this dangerous equipment. Today in our gospel passage, the priest and the elders who are serving in the temple area are questioning Jesus of Nazareth about his credentials. Who are you? And by whose authority do you do what you're doing? And if we look at what happened in the chapter and a half preceding today's reading, it seems like a legitimate question that they would have. Prior to this time, Jesus has been out in the countryside, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and walking past fields and small towns. He's amassed a huge following there. And he's managed to avoid getting entrapped by any would-be enemies up until this point. But in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus as an adult only goes to Jerusalem one time towards the end of his life. And that's the time when the plot in the Gospels begins to thicken. A chapter and a half prior to this reading, Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And the events that we read and remember on Palm Sunday, he's riding into the city on a donkey. It's Passover. This is a huge festival then and now for Jews. It's celebrated differently then from now. Back in the time period of the Gospels, the priest would have conducted sacrifices and worship there at the temple area. Jerusalem would be filled with people who normally didn't live there throughout the year. And just like in our society, when there's a big sporting event or a concert, 
you see all sorts of police officers out there to keep the peace. So on the day of the Passover, as it was approaching, and Jesus comes into the town on a donkey, Roman soldiers would have been everywhere. And they are the only ones who would have been authorized to carry weapons. The crowd instead who greets Jesus wave palm branches, something that in that context was symbolic of the spear at the end of a hand. And they yell, they shall shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They are greeting Jesus because he reminds them of the kings and the messiahs, the anointed ones in the Old Testament, the ones who are not only leaders of the people, but military generals as well. And after that, he goes into the city and he makes a beeline for the temple area. And we're told that there were money changers there in the temple courtyard. Now, what exactly were those money changers doing? Well, they had multiple functions. For one, Roman coinage had Caesar's head on it. And Roman religion taught that after a Caesar died, that Caesar became a part of the Godhead, one of the gods and goddesses of Roman mythology that we've all learned. And there is an inscription that said, Caesar is Lord. So it was considered blasphemous to bring this idolatrous object into the sacred temple area. So different coins were minted. Coins that could be exchanged for other coins and used to buy animals that would have been used in the sacrifices conducted there in that area. They also served as banks in the ancient world. If a couple from Jerusalem was traveling somewhere else and they didn't have any way to keep their money secure, they'd take it to the temple. And the money changers would receive that in exchange for a small fee and give them some verification that upon their return they could use to get their money back. Jesus sees this and he is incensed. The text tells us that he takes a rope with knots tied in it and he knocks over their tables, and he knocks over the carts, and he drives the money changers out. And he says, it is written, my father's house is to be a house of prayer, and you have turned it into a den of robbers. So given the actions that Jesus has done between the time he entered the city, and now when he has returned a second time to the temple, he could very well have looked like somebody who was plotting a coup. Someone who was planning to overthrow the local authorities. And whenever somebody tried to overthrow the Roman authority, Rome responded with overwhelming force. So it's a legitimate question. Who are you? And by what authority are you doing these actions? If we read on, though, in Matthew's Gospel, then we know something about the motivation of the priests and of the elders. They had it pretty good. Jews had their own leader. King Herod was the leader, and after the Herod who was king when Jesus was born died, his sons carried on afterward. And Herod and his sons were pretty much just puppets of Rome. They oversaw the people, but they didn't have any great authority. But they lived well. They had palaces, they had fine clothes and fine food. And anyone within the king's close circle, like this priest and elder, would have lived a very push life. And they don't want Jesus' popularity to take anything from them and this nice lifestyle that they've managed to have for themselves. And we find that they are going to be the ones who will take Jesus before the high priest Caiaphas in order to have him charged and publicly executed. So Jesus is right to be wary of them and question their motivations in their question for him. So Jesus turns it around and he says, all right, I'll ask you a question about someone else's credentials. John the Baptist. Was his baptism from God or of human origin? 
And the people debate among themselves. Well, if we say it was of human origin, then we fear the people because the people believe John to be a prophet. But if we say it was from God, knowing the history that Jesus and John the Baptist have, then he will ask, why then do you not recognize my authority? And so they say to him, well, we don't know. And he says, if you don't know, then I won't tell you. But by virtue of doing this, Jesus is actually giving his credentials, and that of John. In the New Testament and in early Christian writings, novelty was frowned upon. If it has to do with God and it's new, if no one's ever heard about it before, then it's suspect. When we talk about God, it always has to be connected to God's history. God who created the heavens and the earth. God who established a covenant with Abraham and Sarah. God who liberated his people from slavery in Egypt and sent them to the promised land. And God who called the prophets to bring the people in line whenever the people did not keep up their end of the covenant and did not follow God's rules. What happens now is always connected with what's happened in the past. And John is that type of Old Testament prophet, like Elijah, who spoke truth to power and was persecuted for it. And like the other prophets who corrected the people, if you keep living the way you are now, then bad will befall you. Because God is not going to keep your back if you turn your back on God. And John is the one who in the wilderness proclaims the kingdom of God is near. God's promised Messiah is soon to arrive. And when his relative Jesus arrives, he declares, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And at the time of Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, and a voice is heard, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. John's credentials a prophet of God in the line of the Old Testament prophets. Jesus' credentials, the Son of God who takes away the sin of the world. He does it by the authority of His Heavenly Father. Today is World Communion Sunday. It's a day in which we come to celebrate this sacrament in spirit with our brothers and sisters around the world. We have two sacraments in the United Methodist Church, communion and baptism. It's through baptism that we become a part of God's family. It's through baptism that you become my brothers and sisters. And our brothers and sisters span the entire globe. We become a part of the kingdom of God because of what God, through Jesus Christ, has done for us. And if that makes us enter into the family of God, it's the sacrament of communion that sustains us, just like physical food does. It's the bread and the cup that feed us spiritually. And this is a family that is not small like the one of our household. And it's larger than all of us gathered here. We are brothers and sisters with men and women throughout the world who come to the table of Christ today. And it's historic. Being a part of God's family means that you and I are the descendants of those we read about in the Old Testament. The matriarchs and the patriarchs of the Old Testament. The kings and the prophets. They are our people. God promised Abraham, through your descendants, the world will be blessed. And Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, is one of those descendants. And through Joseph and Mary, we are blessed too. And it's also cosmic, because by being a part of God's family, we are connected with the one who created the heavens and the earth. We still have factions. We still have people who seek self-interest above the greater glory of God's kingdom. But this sacrament remains. It redeems it cleanses, it unites. Today we join with our brothers and sisters around the world 
to come to this table to receive the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our affirmation of faith today is the Apostles' Creed, the traditional version, found in the bulletin. Join me as we recite this historic confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Yes. Who are you pointing to, Alan? Who knew it was his birthday? 
Okay, happy birthday. Do you have any concerns to look up? Your sister. Very good. Any other concerns? Our prayer is based on our gospel passage. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we have so many questions. Our brightest scientists realize how little they know about the universe and the body. We do not comprehend the behavior of others. All of us want to know what the future holds. When we have questions, we look to you. Through our baptism, we have become your children. Give us the faith we require to navigate through uncertainty. We are sure of this. You are the Lord, and all power and authority has been placed into your hands. Today, this congregation joins fellow disciples around the world as we come to your table of grace. Unite us in faith and direct us in our ministry to do the work of your disciples. We offer this prayer in your name as we pray as you talk and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now please turn to number 12 in your hymn. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us the joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now I invite you to offer signs of peace and reconciliation to one another. acceptable just to touch the cup. And we also have individual units of bread and the juice if you prefer that, as well as gluten-free options that will be here. I'm reading today for a version of the Great Thanksgiving written for World Communion Sunday. The Lord be with you. And also be Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their communion.
you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today his family in the world is joining in his holy table. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offered for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith.